Hi, my name is Fritzi Horseman, and welcome to Compassion in Action. Today's guest is Dean Williams. Dean Williams was appointed executive director of the Colorado Department of Corrections by Governor Jared Polis on January 8, 2019. Prior to joining Colorado DOC, he was the commissioner of corrections in Alaska, where he oversaw the operation of community jails, halfway houses, pretrial and sentence facilities, probation, parole, and pretrial efforts in the state. Dean served in several capacities during his time in Alaska to include special assistant to Governor Walker, special assistant in the Alaska Department of Public Safety, researcher for the Alaska Legislature, executive director of the Downtown Soup Kitchen, juvenile justice superintendent, youth counselor for the Department of Juvenile Justice, and reserve police officer for the Anchorage Police Department. Dean holds a Bachelor of Science degree in communications from Ohio University. Dean Williams, welcome to Compassion in Action. I'm so excited to have you as our guest because I know what you're doing in Colorado. I see what you're doing. I'd like to start um, with some of the work programs you in initiated in Alaska when you were the director in Alaska, and then also to pivot right to your journey to Norway. So we can talk about that and then we'll get into Colorado. Sure. Good, thanks for having me on board. I've, uh, I've been, I did a little bit of background on some of the podcasts you're doing and so good for you. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing and, and, uh, and glad to be on. Yes, yeah, so you, you had guys leaving prison and working on boats in Alaska. Can you tell us more about that? Well, they were working actually at seafood processing plants. The eventual goal was to potentially send them on working on boats. So every summer, uh, when I, you know, uh, I've, I used to, I ran the Alaska Correctional System for almost three years. And Alaska, like Colorado, um, has a very high recidivism rate, a very high return to prison rate. And that sort of pernicious problem in Colorado, even though that percentage is uh, a little less, it's still almost half. Almost half the people return to prison within three years. That's a serious problem. That's a serious public safety problem. And I think it points out that something's wrong, right? I mean, can we acknowledge that something's wrong? And one of the things that's wrong both in both states, both Alaska and Colorado, is when people leave prison, they've had everything sort of you know, removed from them. I mean, right, a job, social connections, a, a sense of belonging. And um, it's hard to find that again once that's been removed. If you're one of the fortunate people, you have family members who care about you, who can take you in, and you can sleep there. But a lot of men and women who leave have burned a lot of bridges. And even if they want that back, they're like, no, I've, I've, I've learned my lesson. Um, it's hard to find a meaningful place again in society. So in Alaska, um, and this was work had started a little bit before I got there, but I really sort of pushed it there and, and want to push it here and have been pushing it here. Pandemics kind of interrupted a lot of things like in, in the world. Um, but in Alaska, they have a huge, um, you may have heard the salmon from Alaska and, and everything else that is there. And so there's a huge influx of people who come to work at seafood processing plants, not just from around the country, but around the world. They hire individuals from uh, Southeast Asia, from South America, Africa. I've gone to some of these seafood processing plants and it's talk about the melting pot of the world. You have everyone from every kind of background. So I understand that these companies need people to process fish. It's very hard work. It's 12 hours a day, um, most days, sometimes seven days a week. Um, even with the overtime, when the fish are running, they have to be processed. And, and so it's a, it's a huge labor force, a very intensive labor force. And Alaska doesn't have that population. So they fly them in, these companies fly people in. So I started having conversations with some of these seafood companies and, and guess what got I started getting positive re responses on it. So with one company specifically on the Kenai Peninsula, um, we were working men there one season, one summer. They'd come back to the prison at night, sleep, uh, turn around. We'd run them back to the seafood processing plant. And eventually 
the company said, hey, you know, we're building, we got these bunk houses we built to house everyone else because there's no housing for these people who are coming from overseas. They have to have housing. Um, and we started talking about the option of just having them sleep there, work there, sleep there, eat there. We provided a little bit of security. We put like electronic monitoring on, on these guys' legs so we'd know if they ran away or something. Nobody did. Um, because um, here's what people behind the walls know is that the chance of getting out and, and having a job and having an income and I mean, there's dignity back in working again. There's dignity in, in being productive again and paying for one's own way. And a lot of that is removed. So even psychologically, um, prison is a hard place. Uh, I'm trying to make it more humane, not just for the benefit of people there and my staff, but, but we know from all kinds of evidence that if you just make prison a more functional place, guess what? The community is safer because it's less traumatic. They have better chances of uh, succeeding when they get out. So that was the project in Alaska. Um, the name of that, uh, I called it Take Two then. Uh, I couldn't think of a better name here in Alaska. My, my team said we call it the same program. We call it the Take Two program, which stands for Transitional Work Opportunity. So it's really about getting men and women employed before they're released uh, and having uh, a trajectory because once someone is employed before they're released. And so sometimes it means, can they do a job behind the walls, but can they go out and do a job and come back while they're still finishing up their time? So um, we're, we're really talking about people who are getting out uh, fairly soon anyways. And we know that if they're employed and they have a place, um, they just have a better chance of making it. And so that's, that's, really the, uh, that's really the effort behind all this. And what about the money that they earned? Did they get to keep it? What happened? They keep there? it. They keep it. Um, it's all theirs. Um, in Alaska, if they ate, um, they were handled like, I, told, I tell companies, you handle this man or woman like everybody else on your workforce. Um, and if there's any security things and we talk about that separately, like if they run away, um, you don't catch them, we do. Um, we've had very few problems with it because most of these men and women are getting out relatively soon and they just know that this is like the best opportunity for them. So they, they keep all their money. If I was gonna say is that they, in Alaska, if they lived there and ate there, they were charged like five bucks a meal, um, like every, everybody else who worked there. And by the way, I went to eat at some of these places and uh, I was clear out in the Aleutians talking with a company um, about their interest in it too. Um, and the food is quite good. I mean, first of all, all the fresh fish that you want, um, but, and it's a lot of food uh, because these people are working very hard during the day. So the guys who were working at these companies um, were ecstatic, first of all, because they were making money. Yeah, they were getting charged five bucks, but that means there was a lot of food um, and uh, a lot of calories and, and the food was good. And um, so all of that was a very good recipe and it was very attractive towards anybody who's getting out. So it might be a hard job like for a guy like me to do now, uh, but for them, um, they were long days, hard work, and they were really grateful for it. Which kind of leads into the normalization aspect of what I believe you're doing in Colorado, but what you also gathered from Norway. And I, can you talk about normalization and what it means? I don't think our listeners really know what that would mean and how you're making that happen in Colorado. Here, you know, here's the thing, um, as a country, um, I just think, and I'm not the only one that's going to say this, there's many of my colleagues around the country too. I think we've sort of come to a reckoning a bit that something is wrong in our systems. Um, and there's a lot of people, and especially if, you, if anyone's listening who's formerly been incarcerated, they're probably saying, no duh, director, there's a problem. And the interesting, you know, so I went to Norway I was supposed to be back in Norway this last summer and I was actually going to visit the prisons in Germany as well. Um, but there's some lessons to be learned 
from some of these countries who have not had the history that we have had, where 15 or 20 years ago, they were getting the same results we were, which was not very good. Um, and they said, there's something wrong with our systems. I wonder what we should do. And um, it just got very intentional around what their prison should look like. Now, our level of incarceration is much more profound than the rest of these nations, to be clear. But part of our reason why our, our incarceration percentages and rates are so high, and I mean, they just are. Sometimes in some cases we're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times. I mean, we incarcerate more people in our country by far than any other developed nation in the, in, in the world, anywhere. Um, and part of that is that people fail a lot when they get out. So you you're, have a lot of retreads are in prison. I mean, um, and if you had less retreads and people who got out who stayed out, guess what? Your prison population will go down. But since half of the people that were released, I mean, we release, in Colorado, we release six or 700 people a month. Um, when 300 of them are coming back, I mean, that's a problem and that's your target population. So some of the Scandinavian countries in Germany just said, we have to do this differently. And so they got very strategic. They tried to make prisons more normal, which meant uh, we're, we're gonna try to remove the stigma of punishment at the prison. Um, so they, they train their staff that the punishment for the prisoner is the loss of freedom. And you work on dignity and respect um, across the board. And they do a lot of training with their staff to on that principle. Another principle like we just talked about, which is actually how people get out, and they call it progression, which means that there should be a way for people to re release from prison that increases their responsibility before they get out. So when you just dump them out and say, good luck getting a job, you know, good luck finding a place to live and something to eat. Um, and that's a failure to be quite frank. And I see these people get out of prison here in Colorado all the time under that sky. It's not good. So um, they adopted several principles. Another one was just, hey, let's just bring as many people from the outside to work on the inside of the prison. Uh, they call the import model. Um, so, Normalization or what the, what, what the Scandinavian countries really started at 20, 25 years ago, it's not a big mystery. It just says that if we can make prisons a little more normal, a little less punitive, we get better results. And they've studied the heck out of it. Guess what? It's not just those countries. So there's some other states. And I mentioned a lot of times North Dakota, a very conservative state, which has made adopted some of these principles. Uh, Oregon, a, sort of a blue state, liberal state. Um, and we're doing it here in Colorado. And I'm not the only one, and there's other states I'm not mentioning as well, Pennsylvania, there's, there's a number of other states who really have signed on the fact that these, the, what happens behind the walls really matters. And if they're traumatic and they're unsafe uh, and they're more damaging to people who go there, none of that is good for us as a community or a society. And, um, so if that's in it in a nutshell, there's a little bit more to it in terms of how that's implemented. I mean, there's a lot more about how it's implemented, but um, there's, there's, a, there's a basic premise that it could be different. And I, here's the good news. Um, after as a country of going through and having sort of pretty grim results about how many people return to prison, there's a lot of us who are leading these systems now who just realize it can be better. And the proof is in the pudding. Like, let's just try it. And we've tried it in some locations. Um, and it's, we see improvement. We're starting to see improvements, less violence. I mean, um, this stuff really matters. Violent prisons, um, no one wants to work there. Um, the people who come out recidivate at much higher rates. And we've seen plenty of examples of this happening in prisons. Violent prisons produce violent prisoners, produce violent returning citizens. And that's the problem with the, sort of the punitive model that has been in place in this country. Um, so normalization, I, I still wanna, I wanna get into this a little bit more because from my understanding is people wake up 
uh, they have their breakfast, they make their breakfast, they go to work, they do their laundry, they um, make their dinner, they watch television, they, but they have kind of freedom to move about about they move and everybody has a purpose in the morning i was just got to just got done with the media just a minute ago talking about education so here's the difference when you go to halden prison maximum security prison in norway first of all um almost i mean staff and the inmates intermingle like would make all of us nervous in this country because trust has been established Everyone knows whose job. I mean, the inmates, the, you know, the people behind the walls, the, the prisoners, right, know the staff go home at night. It's still a prison for them. But you see staff and, um, <clears throat> and the prisoners playing basketball together, um, eating meals together. Like, that would make us all crazy in this country. And I have a bunch of my staff when I start talking about because we're making some of these changes. Um, the Norwegians call it dynamic security, right? Which is just essentially, if I get to know you and you get to know me, guess what? Um, things get safer, right? We start to have a, um, a functional social relationship the way that we have. I don't see you as the enemy. You don't see me as the enemy. I'm not here to punish you as a staff. You're not there to make my life miserable as a prisoner. Um, and to get back at me because I'm being mean to you, all of a sudden things just get normal. So dynamic, so, inter, so interpersonal relationships get normal. That's huge. It's huge, and we've missed in this country. The other thing is, is that you're right. There's only one meal provided a day in most prisons in Norway. It's lunch. It's cooked by somebody else. Uh, but in the morning, you make your own meal. At dinner, you make you make you cook your own food. And and guess what? Guys sit around cooking food, and they help out. Um, they get along, there's functional relationships, there's not tensions, there's virtually no subcultures, there's no gangs, um, there's no place for them, too much is at stake. And if one of the guys who doesn't understand that this is the way we run our prisons, you know, they, they get regressed, they, but nobody wants, once they're there, I mean, you've talked, I've talked to plenty of guys who were in Eastern Bloc prisons, by the way, who were in Norway, Norwegian prisons, and they're like, oh my God. Yeah, I got busted and I deserve the time I'm getting, but thank God I'm doing my time here because I'm not going to worry about getting stabbed. I'm not going to get worried about anything being unsafe. Um, and it makes it safer, safer for the staff too. So you're right. So everybody gets up in the morning, they either have a job, they, they have some educational thing they're doing. There's no sitting around. I mean, the greatest motto I saw was actually on a on a coffee cup, a Norwegian coffee cup, which translated, because it was a Norwegian, translated said, just don't sit there. Um, and um, that idleness, I don't know about you, uh, Fritzi, but idleness in my life is not generally a good thing unless it's, I'm laying on a beach because I, I, I really do need a nap. Um, but um, if you have something to do to look forward to today. And I have an activity to do today. And that's probably one of the most premised bases of, of what normalization is, is that there is purpose there. And the result, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, the recidivism rate over, over 20 years is, is, was, is half what it is now. Here's another country, Ireland, by the way, um, who has very old prisons, like some pretty dark stuff. Um, they adopted some of the same principles. They've, they've gone from 45, 50% to I think the last I, I met the head of the Irish prison system about three years ago, and they're like a 35% recidivism rate, 30, I mean, in five years um, that they've been trying to do, you know, adopt some of this. So we know it works. And in trying it here in the country, we've seen, we've seen improved safety. Um, one small example, then we can move on. In, my, in Alaska, uh, I asked officers at one prison to spend 15 minutes, 15 minutes with three prisoners talking, social interaction on anything. And I asked them to do it, I think once, maybe twice a week, because in the back of there, there are a week on and a week off. Um, and I, we tried it for six months. Guess what we saw in six months? And we didn't do it the entire prison. We only did like, because I wasn't forcing staff. Is it staff? 
we're going to try dynamic security, which all it means is that I want you, we assign you three prisoners. You have 15 minute conversations with them twice a week, since you're working a week on and a week off. Uh, guess what we saw? We saw reduced violence after six months. Now, you can't go back, you know, it's hard to say, well, that was the exact cause of it, you know, I mean, it's hard to go back and do that, but you can draw some inferences. Um, and then we also talked to the prisoners. Then I talked to the staff about it afterwards. The staff were like, we thought this was a hokey idea. Director, what's wrong with you? Um, but I got volunteers. I got about, you know, a certain amount of volunteers for staff to do it. And then we talked to the prisoners afterwards. And guess what they were saying? They're saying, you know, officer so-and-so never liked that guy, but he's not so bad. He's not so bad. Um, so that, that's a change of philosophy and a very important one on how I have led both states uh, correctional systems and how I'm leading us here in Colorado. And guess what? Most of the staff, they know their job could be bigger and more important. They want to be mentors to people. They could, you know, um, and so I, I, that's a long journey that we're on because we've created a very punitive system in this country. But uh, I think that the evidence is very strong about what happens when you just say, look, we're just gonna do it differently. Yeah, so if you would tell an officer in most penal systems in, in, in America that you need to talk with a prisoner, they would say they're gonna manipulate me, right? That's the- Oh, sure. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, no, exactly. And um, the problem with that is we've already set up, um, we continue to advance and set up um, a dynamic between us and them um, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know. Um, let's talk about this in any other human interaction, right? As a boss or as a parent, um, there's very little other human interaction that we have that we set up the dynamic that we set up in prison interactions, right? Which is to start off with this suspicious place that you are fundamentally different and there's no way to see it in any dynamic, no matter how much I get to know you, I'm never going to trust you about anything, right? Um, or for people who work for me, right? If I approach every person who works for me and says, you know, I'm probably going to have to watch you like a hawk. Because until, you know, that's just my job, because I'm going to, I'm not going to believe you're going to tell me the truth or anything else like, you know, you know and, and it feeds off the inmate population as well, because they go like, that guy's just a jerk. And they work against the staff. And we create this headbutting dynamic that is just reinforces this us versus them. And in that dynamic, there's not much good that's gonna happen. Now, that does not mean, for your listeners, please hear me very clearly. That does not mean that we don't have some really bad guys who are behind the walls, who have done some really dangerous things and they still represent a danger to our staff. They do, they do. But that's not everyone behind the walls. And we treat them as if they're one conglomerate group, right? That there's no way that we should ever be able to trust any of them for anything. Well, you know, there's rules and policies. We don't let people run around, you know, outside the prison and hope they come back home at night. No one is suggesting that. But we have to understand that when people come to prison, 90, 95% of them are coming home. And what happens there in the dynamics in between our staff and them matters. And the more that my staff can take on a coaching role uh, or a mentorship role, or even, here's a, here's a radical notion. I wonder if an officer could be a friend to an inmate the same way that if you and I got to know each other, that we could be friends to each other. Now, I think there's people who work for me, right? Um, who I would count as friends. Uh, I have a great executive team. I love these people. Um, I count them as friends on the head. That doesn't change the power differential that I know that I'm still their boss while I'm in this job. But when I'm out of this job, I don't have the burden then of 
having to be their boss and their dynamic, but can I still be their friend and be their boss too? Well, with some people I can. Can I do that with everybody? No, I can't. For some people, they may want to take advantage of the fact that they think they're being friends with the boss or conversely, maybe I can leverage them because I'm the boss and now a friend and I can extract something out of them as a boss, which is the reason why you have terrible bosses who are raging or doing inappropriate things with their subordinate employees. So that can happen in any context, but don't we want to try to teach that for people behind the walls to say, look, yeah, I'm an officer here. And there's, that's not going away. But if you have a problem and something's happening in your family, if you don't have anybody else to talk to, I got 15 minutes for you. What's it, how's it going? You know, that, that changes everything. And so, yeah, there are inmates who are gonna to wanna to manipulate staff. And there are staff who we have hired who are gonna to wanna to manipulate inmates and who are not there for the right reasons. And it's the reason why we have some, why, how does staff succumb to drug trafficking, for example, or having inappropriate relationships with an inmate you know, population, right? I mean, it's something I'm extremely alert to with uh, especially female prisoners. When I go to see a female facility and, you know, I know I'm a male. I know I'm also the, uh, I'm also the director of the correctional system. That has never left me, but can I not talk to the female prisoners in a way that would be, that I'd want other men to talk to them and be respectful and say, here's an opportunity for us to have a positive interaction with each other that's appropriate and good and healthy. And we're paranoid about the bad things happening. And we should be training about it and cautious about it and, and careful and, hey, don't do that. That's not the right thing to do. You're sending the wrong message. You know, be careful. Um, but I do that all the time with the people who work for me too. And I, Sometimes I get, you know, maybe I get it wrong with them. Maybe sometimes I'm too familiar. I'm like, oh, gee, I, didn't, I didn't mean that. Sorry about that. Um, or it's too casual. Or um, maybe they were, you know, doing the same thing and trying to hit me up for something because now they have a more personal relationship. Like I bought a promotion or something like that. that no, 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 no. That would be inappropriate, right? So that's what we need to teach behind the walls is that it's okay for us to know it's okay to have a personal, the Norwegians would say it's okay to have a personal relationship, but not a private relationship, right? Yeah. And, and guess what? Now here in Colorado, we teach it, right? So in one of the changes we made in terms of what we teach at the academy, we teach about dynamic security and the importance of having some sort of functional, healthy relationship with the people in our custody. And yeah, we still need to be careful and be mindful that people are going to manipulate us and might try to get something out of us. But that should never be allowed and it should be called out. Even if it was sort of a testing or a casual mistake. So um, that's why I think um, there's a desperate need. And I you know I asked this question in Norway, hey, how many times has staff had inappropriate relationships with a population? They looked like, they looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, what are you talking about? We would, we trained for weeks on this, right? That if we saw anything um, that looked even smelled funny, but you know, so I saw staff and inmates in Norway playing checkers or chess together. I saw a an inmate who was had developmental disabilities who clearly had some uh, mental challenges uh, playing basketball with a female officer. Nobody thought there was anything funny about that because the boundaries were very clear and because it was expected that that officer was gonna have a personal relationship, you know? And they were laughing and their basketball was terrible by the way, but they were having such a fun time and she was spending time with that um, developmentally challenged inmate because it kept them both safer. The entire facility was safer because now they know each other and now there's mutual respect. We always practice, you know, mutual respect every day. You know, that's the way they, uh, they approach it. And um, we have a lot to learn. And I think we have to be open that maybe we just don't have it quite right yet. Um, and that's the sort of the big rub. 
sometimes and taking over these systems to say, look, I love everything good that we're doing. And I love everyone who's been doing this job, but can we just acknowledge that maybe something's not right here and our results are not what they should be. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about accountability. Um, we ask everybody that's incarcerated to be accountable for their crime, but there's this, um, there's this phrase in prisons, and I'm, I'm not sure if it still exists in Colorado, but what happens behind the bars stays behind the bars, which means um, officers can act with impunity and they don't, there's no accountability for some of the crimes that happen to the, the people that are incarcerated. And so I'm just wondering how you deal with that and how, how um, transparency is, 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 is kind of the edict in your, in your system. Well, one thing, um, accountability has to be strong for um, misconduct. And when things go wrong, um, you can't hide the ball. So kind of what happens behind prisons, like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, that sort of thing. Both, both sayings are wrong, right? Um, and the challenge I had in Alaska, and I, I mean, I love that department, still do, um, but there was a problem in terms of accountability, which was one of the first things I had to face, which was like, um, things are being lied about. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways the lies are being tolerated. Mm -hmm. So the first standard is set, and I don't really have to set it here in Colorado because, quite frankly, they own it. Um, Colorado is a very good system that I, I enjoy the privilege and uh, pleasure of leading, and their credibility and their honesty around we own the truth um, is very strong. But that's not true across the country, of course. Um, and the first difficult thing is to be a leader to say, uh, we're going to tell the truth every single day, even when it's painful. And it is painful. There's things that have happened in the two years I've been leading to Colorado. I go, oh, my God, really? Oh, this is not good. But um, like it is unacceptable um, in, in any time to lie. It just is. Now, we tell that to our kids and we tell that to people who work for us and and if we cannot maintain that standard, it's the other thing why the inmate population looks at us like you're a bunch of liars mm -hmm. and, and like the heck with you. Um, and why should I give any respect to you as an officer if you're covering up or if there's anything that like that, that that starts to breathe life behind the walls? Because prison can be a, and is in general sense, a pretty closed environment. Um, but so the first thing is to set down is that we will not accept any, we will not tolerate any form of deception or deceit. We just don't. And if you get in trouble and screw up, you better own it. I do. I mean, I try to set the example of a staff, I'm like, hey, sorry about that. I was a little snappy. My bad. Uh, shouldn't, you know. And guess what happens? Like grace comes in, right? And um, so if an officer makes a mistake and they own up to it, I always feel like, well, there's okay, we got a chance there. You know, we can redeem because maybe that prisoner got that guy officer goat you know and he got hooked a bit and all of a sudden the officer's like man I screwed up I was that was you know I'm sorry I was yelling at that inmate I was calling him this and everything out of the book my bad I own it okay well yeah that was bad um, but that's somebody that's an officer that we can work with right I mean that's somebody so I think the first thing you have to establish and you have to set that example as a, an executive team that and I apologize to staff. Um, if I get something wrong, I have to, like, it's okay to say, I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do better. And having it in being a leader who's not afraid of being wrong. That does not mean, by the way, that I'm soft on what I think the standards are going to be or where we're going to go and who we are. But I think you have to lead that from the top. And I think you have to be reflective. And um, I think people will come along with you. So, um, and, and by the way, I think you need systems inside the correctional system that enforce that. And that's the reason why virtually every state in the country has some type of internal affairs, right? I know. To get things. And to say, um, whatever we find out is what we find out. 
And sometimes with the things they find out that come across my desk and going like, holy smokes, what happened here? Um, but never would it ever be okay and tolerated to say, well, we better not, you know, just kind of bury that thing. Well, it's a horrible road to go down. And so I think that that's at a cornerstone, Ritzy, in terms of, of how you, how inmates and officers know that these are prison systems, things go wrong, mistakes are made, people's tempers, people, inmates who have very hard life, you know, family problems on the outside. I mean, um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. You just have to be very honest about it when they do. Yeah, I, I was, you know, the dignity and respect is kind of like what every person living in prison craves is front of, it's kind of what I'm learning is just to be, just to be held with respect. So when these, these bad things happen from the officers and they do something, are, are efforts made to heal that relationship or to heal the wrong that was created? Um, well, I, I think one holding all of us accountable when it does, including the inmate population, like you screwed up, there's a consequence. Um, is one of the first ways of healing things, right? In terms of saying, yeah, a bad thing happened here. We acknowledge a bad thing happened. <clears throat> um, if there's an opportunity between that officer and staff for that to be healed, um, yeah, we, we look for that to happen. But here's another thing, though, that sets a really good framework. Some of the other things that we're doing that give the inmate population this sense of purpose around normalization, um, this stuff really matters because when mistakes are made, um, the staff and the inmates go, well, this, this isn't the only, this isn't the, doesn't have to be the hallmark moment um, that maybe that it is. Now, here's an example. You know, we, we've, we've created a podcast. We have our own podcast, by the way. I don't know if you knew that or not, Fritzy. Um, called Within. There's a small plug. Um, uh, we have a newspaper called Within. Well, we're developing, I mean, um, um, I don't want to talk too much about some of our future endeavors, but we're researching our, our, at a radio station, all run by inmates. Um, we have theater projects and art issues and all those things. So even when something wrong happens to someone who's on the inside, they know that our mission is still to create opportunities for them to have a meaningful existence. And when those other things exist, then you then it's like, you know, if something ha bad happens in my life, um, bad thing happens, I can go, well, that's just not the only thing in my life. Like, like that's the only thing I have. I have a home. I have a, a, a lovely wife. I have two great kids. I've got, you know, I've got other people who are my friends. I mean, that guy doesn't like me, but a lot of people do. And it doesn't my life doesn't hang in the balance of generally of one thing or one bad interaction or, um, and that um, you're right, that dignity and respect that um, is a very personal thing. And people behind the walls know, um, know what, know where staff are operating from. And I want more staff operating from dignity and respect and if I find the people who don't, I'm, you know, um, they're not going to enjoy working in our department. Um, so, um, and that's our job as the bosses really is to say you no. Know. And when I visit the prisons, I mean, I haven't very much because of the pandemic, like none in the last year. But um, I mean, maybe this will change a little bit with the pandemic, but um, I, you know, I, I greet prisoners. Hi, I'm Dean. I'm the director. Who are you? You know, I shake their hand. Maybe there'll be a little less handshaking now just because of the pandemic until we get on their side of it. But I expect reciprocal um, relationships. I mean, some irony, a small thing is that um, can a prisoner call me by my first name? Well, that would be unheard of in most prisons. It's not unheard of in a lot of our prisons. And so I allow some of the prisoners to call me by my first name if they want to. A lot of them out of respect, they don't want to. But I would never allow them to call me Dean and be disrespectful the same way. And, and by the way, a lot of times, maybe depending upon this level, I know them, right? If I don't, 
if I don't know them well, if I don't know someone I well, you know, very well that I mean I'm professional, I better call them, I'm called a Mr. or Mrs. Miss So and so, right? Maybe not by their first name because it wouldn't be respectful. Just so the same thing, but some of the prisoners who I know better because I've seen them multiple times or I've seen them in theater shows, they may call me Dean because that's the appropriate level of sort of uh, familiarity that they can have to call me by my first name. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I, I, you brought up the arts programs that you have. And I also wanted to talk, you did one flew over the cuckoo's nest, I believe, but it said it was touring. So did it go to all the other prisons? I no, I went to two other prisons. Um, I did go on a tour. Um, sort of funny stories that most of these guys who were in prison had been in a bus or had been in a road, like, like quite a number of the guys got, um, you know, car sick, um, traveling to the other prison because they haven't been in a car for like years. And some of these guys were in for fairly serious crimes. And so we only went to prisons that we could be assured that had security, but those theater shows like changed like that prison. I, I don't know how to, it's sort of hard to con convey what happens when you have a bunch of men or women who are part of a project they're creating, especially that has some sort of artistic background to it. All of a sudden they feel connected to something bigger than their own little problem. Um, they feel like they're in a community with each other, which is the key of running prisons. There has to be some sense of community there the fact that men and women behind the wall talk about it all the time. They talk about, you know, director, we really had a community. We thought we were just doing a theater show and we realized we had a community and we were on a mission together. And they were, there was no way they were gonna jeopardize anything about that. I took women, by the way, uh, into public and they performed at Denver University. Uh, and so I work with this partnership of Denver University Prison Arts Initiative, um, which is a lovely lady by the name of uh, Ashley. Ashley, uh, Dr. Hamilton, who uh, runs that program, who and I, who and I, we've become friends. Um, and uh, she talks about this all the time, about the way that they own everything that we give them an opportunity to do. So those theater issues and the trust that was developed. I mean, there's some, there's some security things we were concerned about. Um, but the, the ladies that we took to the public to do a Christmas carol, um, there was no way they were gonna let anything happen. It was too much on the line. The deep sense of, of responsibility they felt, you cannot buy that. I, you can't buy it in a prison. When people behind the walls own their space and own who they are. And, and they're very transparent. And so after the show, they had, we had several shows, they had a talk back. I mean, it, it man, it's, it was hard. To, I mean, I was on the stage with them and it's hard to, because they're so honest and so transparent about their own uh, brokenness and what got them there. I mean, it's like a cry fest, like for half of the audience, right? But it's so powerful because they're, their own said, look, I, I heard somebody get here. This is something I wake up with every day. Um, I live in this guilt, this shame of every day of, I didn't know, it was a, as a kid, I didn't think I was gonna be in prison. Now I've done this thing and this is, this is a, my life now. What am I gonna do? And, and then they say, you know, this opportunity to give back and to be a good person again, um, it stays with them for months, years. I still talk to the ladies now about who are in that show and they're like, hey, director, remember when we did that show? Like, of course I remember when we did the show. Um, they're not living just doing the show, they're living in the spot that I was, I was a good person then. Now, that's not everybody behind the walls. There's some people behind the walls I've said before who are dangerous and I'm gonna hold the last day but that's not the majority of the people. Most of the people behind the walls are remorseful. There's a whole bunch of sociopaths too, scare me. Yeah. And I keep them there the last day I can because they're scary to us. But even those individuals, um, there should be an expectation of dignity and respect uh, that I give, that my staff give to them and they reciprocate to us. And if they can't, then um, we'll deal with that. But, 
Um, 95% of the people in prison are coming home. That's right. 95%. And um, who do you want to be your neighbor? Someone who has a job, who, whose experience in prison wasn't completely destructive to their, their ego and their persona, that they have a reason to live, that they have a social connection, they belong to something. You want them as your neighbor, not the person who came straight out of solitary confinement, who was so dangerous, we couldn't even manage them in the prison. Put them next beside you and see how that goes. Okay, uh, you brought up solitary. So you're, <laughs> you followed Rick Ramish's uh, work to end long-term solitary. How's that going? I'm, because I'm, you know, this is, this to me seems to be really what's up for America right now is to end this because like you said, 95% are coming home and the damage that's created in solitary is sometimes irreparable. It is, and we know it. Um, I mean, if I put you or anybody listening in a cell for 24 hours or even a week, let me throw you in for a week. Let me see how you do after you come out a week. I mean, I have a tiny little bit of claustrophobia in me, but uh, I can tell you, I would not do well. It's damaging. It's extremely damaging. Um, so I get to enjoy the benefits of the work that Rick Ramish did. Um, and to show that we can still operate a correctional system and eliminate solitary confinement. Now, those really bad individuals who I mentioned before, so your, your audience is like, well, well, what do you do with them? Right. What about somebody who assaulted your staff? I mean, doesn't that make you mad? I'm like, hell yes, it makes me mad. Um, and if someone hurt my wife or something, I'd want them to be in a little corner. But the reality is, is that all I'm doing is making things more dangerous, not just for my staff and the way that solitary is run. And, and, um, and so we still take those individuals and, Many times they're restrained at a table, but they're out for four or five hours playing cards with each other. And if some of them we think are still so dangerous, I'm like, no, you're coming out, you're sitting down, you're gonna have leg restraints on, you're gonna have your arm restraints, you're gonna have a cup of coffee here at the table, a couple other guys, and let's do that for a while. Oh, you can do that for two months? Well, maybe you can come out for eight hours now, but the reality is that no one is, you know, the definition of solitary confinement is in a cell for, you know, extend you know, more than 15 days, or more than uh, more than 22 or 23, 22 hours, 21 to I think it's 20 hours a day, uh, and and so we bring people out for at least four hours a day, five hours a day. Now they're still pretty restricted because some of those individuals are very dangerous, um, but it's the elimination of the this 23 or sometimes 24 hours a day for days on end. It's hugely destructive. And guess what? Prisons around the country have been releasing some of those folks straight from solitary. Rick Ramish talked a lot about that from Colorado, about releasing people out of leg irons from solitary confinement. How are those people gonna function? You know, they're hugely dangerous. So doing all those things to try to step down from that very punitive stance um, is for everyone's safety. Um, that's, that's the message here. Um, how do we make our, how do we make this country safer? Well, one way is that we make prisons safer. I mean, it's fundamental that if our prisons are unsafe, that the people who are coming out are much worse for the wear. And, um, I've had very many spirited conversations with people who maybe don't see it the way that we see it. And um, I just say, look, I just disagree with you, but the evidence is clear. Go look at prisons that um, where their permissions were given to staff to sort of rough up the prisoners or to be really hard on the prisoners. Pelican Bay is a great example in California. Hugely, huge violence most unsafe place for staff to work. Recidivism rates are the highest. And um, that's the reason why most of my colleagues and I um, just see this 
at the, at the when I was interviewed for the podcast, they call it the shift. Mm. They call it, director, it's the shift. We are we're all calling it the shift, and um, they were very um, um, probing about what their role was in the shift. And I said, the, your role is the, behind the walls is to help me convince the people behind the walls who are running drugs and trafficking and doing all this other um, misconduct, um, that there's a better way. While I try to convince my staff and the public, you need to help me convince the people behind the walls. That this is in everyone's best interest, including theirs. So um, it's a journey. Shenanigans, that's what I call it. Um, and you call it no, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, no, well, some of those shenanigans are um, sort of minor in some cases, but can be very serious in others. Absolutely. And it sets up the situations of violence that is um, just scares me. And it scares me about the conditions of people who work there. I tell people, look, if, even if you didn't care people about people who are in prison, which I think is morally wrong, we should because there's a lot of good reasons why we should in addition to moral reasons. Um, but think about the people who are working there. You know, think about the conditions that, there's a reason why correctional officers life expectancy is about 10 years shorter than everybody else because the stressors of the job are real. And um, I want people to have the view corrections and being a correctional officer is a noble profession, it is. Mm -hmm ready, but I want it to be a place where more people are attracted to come and work because, hey, you know what, I can make a difference here. And that's what you see when you see systems that are running differently. Um, people um, view that career as, um, as a real opportunity to make a difference in the criminal justice system, and it should be. So you talk about correctional officers as mentors, but you also, in our previous conversation, you talk about peer-to-peer programming. And what is the, what is the genesis from that idea? Because I really think it's genius because. Um... Well, we know that um, um, even in some of the worst prisons um, that you would say, well, they have, they really incarcerate too many people. Their sentences are so long. And I'm thinking of Angola prison mm -hmm. in Louisiana, Louisiana state penitentiary. Um, this is a huge, massive complex of four or 5,000 prisoners. It's it's on the banks of the Mississippi River. It's like about five prisons set on this thing and has a terrible history. It's named Angola because of the, the history of slaves um, that were brought there. And, um, and it has a long, horrible history. And the men who are sentenced there have really long histories. And Louisiana has a very long sentencing scheme. Um, and I'm not, I'm not kicking on them at all. Um, but there's something good happening there in the middle of that um, Bert Kane, right? Yeah, but well, Bert Kane, and about what he did about creating the seminary program and how inmates help inmates. So when an inmate's having a problem, guess who helps them? Another inmate. And they set up a whole mentorship program there. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I wouldn't want to trade anything going on there. I mean, there's old buildings. I mean, some of the places that big, huge um, bunk, you know, bunk places where 50 men sleep at one time. I'm like, Oh man, this is like grim. But I walked around that prison um, being given a tour by lifers. Um, and I never felt safer in my life. Um, just because the attitude is there is like, um, and Angola is one of the most violent prisons 20 years or 25, 30, horrible history. Um, and it's not like they're perfect by any means now. I think there's still a lot of problems, but we all have problems in our systems, but um, it's all peer to peer and they're all looking after each other. And they're all, the people who run the chaplains or the, or the churches there, all inmates, gone to the, went to seminary school there, run at the prisons, developed the prison by Burl Kane. Um, the, all the things that they do in terms of peer counseling so we know this is true even when prisoners are released to communities. If there's a, um, a place where they live, where there's a small group of them, Oxford House is an example in Colorado around the country that in order to live there, you have to be a recovering addict. Um, and they're in houses of five or six people. 
these were, there's a house back in Alaska that was doing the same thing too, where all drug addicts lived at. Um, the, the success rates are very large. The recidivism rates are very low. Mm. And so we just know that if I can get um, people behind the walls involved in their own care of each other, and, um, and you see that uh, around the newspaper, go, go read the crew, the newspaper crew, and you know, um, it's cool. It's fun to hang out with them because they're all, they're all part of something with each other. And then they have this mutual um, responsibility like, this isn't just about me anymore. This is about us and what we're doing here. Mm. Maybe part of what we're doing here is just figuring out how to get by and how to maybe pick up some skills or do something along the way that's constructive, even while I'm doing my time. And when it's going well, um, it's fun to hang out with these guys who are trying to do life behind the walls with each other. And there's other programs. There's a Redemption Road CrossFit program, I think, out of Lyman that, that is fantastic. There's black guys, white guys, Hispanic guys, all working out, high-fiving each other. Um, man, you can't buy that. And that's what you want, right? You want them having a sense of community with each other. And what we need to do as staff is to say, good on you. Hey, can I... You know, here was the here was the real accomplishment that that, that redemption that CrossFit program. Um, when I found out that people from the community, there were some cops that came in, and my staff, they had a competition. I don't know how you I don't know how you compete in CrossFit, but they did. Um, and my staff were working out with the inmates, with the guys. I mean, this would have been unheard of. Maybe they got in trouble a few years ago. But um, you can't, that change, that changes that prison. It just changes it. Us versus them becomes us. That's just what becomes it becomes us. This it is just what we're doing. That's it. And that's, that's what, what I see as the peer to peer thing, which is important in prison so that people can understand what it looks like when you get out. We have a returning guy. He said, you know, he walked into a mall or a, an area where there are a lot of people. He says, oh, well, he was looking out, there's a white guy. Okay, there's a Hispanic guy, he's African-American. So he's already seeing where he, but that's not normal in society. We don't divide people like that anymore. Or, well, we do, but, um, but when you- Well, start- we hope we're doing it less, but the problem is, is that the issues around the race, uh, racial issues and the injustice issues in the country are still real. Yes. They are. And guess what? They're real in prison. And if you really want to see them, break down, uh, look at some of what happens with the racial issues around a lot of these hard prisons where the white guys live with the white guys, black guys live with the black guys, Hispanic guys live with the Hispanic guys. And you create gang cultures and subcultures around that in prison. It's hugely dangerous. Yeah, California, just- Yeah, you know, and, and it, well, it's not just California. There's other states as well. We have some of our own problems here, not as bad as some states, but um, there's a lot of reasons why um, normalization and breaking the subculture of gangs, uh, just in society in general, is a good idea, but it's also especially a good idea in prisons. Well, survival is the key element, right? So that that's why you you break up into your own in your to be exactly like you, exactly look like you. So once exactly. you lower the survival threat, if that goes off the table if you feel safe, then you can bring in all this, but safety is first, right? And we all know that, that's, that's a, you know, but what's interesting is prisons don't create public safety. Um, that's the irony, you go into prison and it creates more public danger because people come out worse than when they entered and they commit more crimes. I think, boy, Fritzy, if you really hit, I mean, if, if everybody forgets everything else, but remembers that, that if you want improved public safety in the community, what happens behind the walls should matter just as much to you as whether or not a crime is committed in your neighborhood or not. Because the reality is, is that there's a good chance the person who's committing that crime is somebody who's already been in prison. And, uh, and some of these people we're not gonna be able to reach. You know, no one's Pollyannish about this. 
there are some people who are sociopaths or um, who scare me and should scare you. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of others who have really, uh, they know they jacked it up and they just want to figure out, do I have a second chance of figuring out how to get normal again? And um, if you have really dangerous prisons and people are getting worse there and they come back out, I mean, these are the people that, um, these are the people that are, um, that are going to get in trouble again and um, they're going to do violent crimes again because they got nothing to lose now. And, you know, I tell people commonly, if, when you have nothing to lose and going back to prison is not that big of a deal. Right. You know, if you have nothing to lose, then, then don't. But if you do, even if you've been a bit on a pretty persistent knucklehead beforehand, <laughs> and you talk to some of these guys who have jobs now and have dignity back in there, oh man, they just carry themselves differently. I talk to these guys in the community who are doing this take two program or working during the day and coming back to the prison at night, you know, they just carry themselves differently. They're, they have, there's a purpose in them again. And, and you want that. And you want that in people coming out of prison. And if you're going to develop it, you got to have prisons that make sense. You got to have to have prisons that are functional. And you have to have prisons that are humane. And people are still doing their time. They're still serving their, you know, they're still serving their uh, uh, punishment by losing their freedom. But that should be the extent of the punishment is the loss of freedom, not the loss of humanity, because the loss of humanity just makes things worse for the rest of us, let alone them. It just makes it worse for the rest of us. And it makes things more unsafe for everybody else, not just for that person and not just for staff who have to work in that environment. How did you become so um, such a game changer? I mean, like, this is a big, big view. This is, you know, to, to lead a, a prison uh, corporation or world that you're, that you're involved in, there, it's something got to you, something, I, and I have a feeling it has to do with some of your faith, but also just, you see the humanity and. Well, a big, a big part of it does have to do with my faith, but um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian that, um, I believe, um, what's instructed in the Bible. I believe the things that I'm to love the things that I'm not I mean to wax faith with your, with your listeners, but just I, I'm supposed to love the things that Jesus loves. Yes. And if I don't love those things, then, then there's something wrong that I'm not, that I'm not who I say I am. That's the first thing. But the other thing I said, I had a seminal moment that changed my heart and my mind about a lot of things. And, um, the short story of it is, is that I went to visit a family member of a, um, of a person who died in prison at the hands of officers back in Alaska before I took the job. And um, this was an Alaska Eskimo woman in a very small village in Western Alaska. Um, and I went to show her the video of how her son died in prison and I went to apologize for the governor because I was working for the governor of Alaska. I was his special assistant. And um, that moment changed my life because I just wanted to get the, in there and get the heck out. I'd been to that village many times. I worked in Western Alaska. I, I helped as a, I worked in the DA's office and I, I did paralegal investigation work and I, was, I helped throw a lot of people in prison. Um, I had known that village. And um, uh, I just want to get in there and get out because um, that village was a mess. Mm. And the Laris law enforcement was 150 miles back from where I was coming from. Um, but that woman whose son died completely unacceptably about how he died at the hands of officers who unintentionally killed him, but they did. Um, like she prayed for me and she said, thank you for bringing this man to me and please don't have my children who were all around because she had a whole family with, I mean, there was like 25 or 30 of them 
and me, this super white dude in the middle of a, of a, of a Nupiak village uh, where they have every reason to be angry and hostile at the death of their loved one in prison. And she offered grace to me. She said, please, she prayed for me. She said, please don't have my children be angry at this man who came to tell us the truth. And would you please find the help the governor find someone to do something about this so it never happens to anybody else again? Oh man, I was I was like, I was a wreck, and I was just convicted on the spot because all my friends, there were, some people were contemplating. I think the governor was contemplating maybe you should run the correction system, and I was like, there's no way. I just discovered what was happening with it. There's no way I'm going to run it. You crazy? In fact, it. I made the governor promise me that, that I wasn't going to get sucked into it. Um, but man, my heart just changed. I just turned the other way um, because I knew that if I had a chance to try to do something, um, why wouldn't I, how could I say no? I mean, did I feel qualified? Did I feel like I was really setting myself up in a good spot? No, I thought it was going to be a disaster. I was just kind of bringing the bad news to the Department of Corrections and now I was gonna run the darn thing. And my wife was like, I, all my, some of my friends like, Dean, don't do it. You know, you can't bring bad news and then run the department. I'm like, are you crazy? I'm not gonna run the department. Governor's promised me I had to come back and I get to be his special assistant again. Um, but, but that Nupiak woman, Helen Panachuk, um, and she changed me because she prayed on me and I was convicted by my faith that if I was given the opportunity to make something better, why wouldn't I do it? And I think kind of what you're exploring in this podcast is that if you have an opportunity to make something better and you're in a role, no matter what your role, or not you're running a prison system or you're an advocate or wherever you're at, like the answer is like, just say yes, it's just try, try to do something. And if it falls and it fails, like, I didn't think, I mean, I thought the chances of failure of me getting, like, this working out, me taking that job, I thought the chances of failure was more than 50%. Um, how was I going to be accepted? How would the officers trust me? I mean, but that journey into that village not only brought me to lead Alaska, but here, here I am in Colorado. I mean, that's... That's because I said, yes, <laughs> wisely or not, I said yes, um, because there was a conviction on me um, that if Helen Panachuk was praying for someone to do something, maybe that somebody was, was just me. That's right. Thank you. We belong to each other. That's right. Well, Rick, uh, I'm not Rick, uh, Dean. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no worries. Um, when I get emotional, I don't, uh, words collide. Uh, Dean, this conversation has been illuminating and I hope your peers and other directors will listen and pay attention to the lessons you're learning and the lessons and the the results that you're, you're manifesting. Well, keep hope alive. There's a lot of good people. There's a lot of good directors and I don't want to name them because I'm going to leave some out and I'm going to feel bad about it. There's a lot of good, I'm not the only one who's had an awakening and awareness that something is wrong and we're going in a different direction. There's a lot of good leaders, not just in the blue states or, or red states, both states. Um, and if there's, anything that brought sort of the whole issue around racial injustice that still exists in the country. Guess what? My colleagues and I, my fellow directors and I, um, it's out there now in front of us in a big way. There's some really good leaders in these state systems. They have a long journey ahead of them. So do I uh, of making changes, but the people who are coming after us, the people who are hiring as deputies and, people were bringing along, um, nobody wants to go back. There's some that are still kind of hanging on. There's some states that are still kind of hanging on. But the, the most of us, 
um, know there's a new way forward. That should be an encouragement to us. Well, thank you for guiding us and for taking the risks to make the big change. Thanks so much for having me. I have one more question. Sure. Would you, would you consider doing Hamilton at, at Colorado prisons? H Hamilton? Yes. Well, first of all, the rights on that alone is probably impossible. There's no way you can get rights to it. Uh, I will tell you though, that as COVID ends up, I'll give you a, a preview um, because we have to, I think I'm allowed to talk. I think the professor will allow me to talk about it. Um, our inmates are doing a, um, a interview based play. Uh, if you know the, the interview play, uh, the Laramie project, the around the death of Matthew Shepard in Wyoming and, and the issues around that, his entire murder. And uh, because he was a, he was a gay young man. Um, well, um, Denver University, the Prison Arts Initiative and us, the department, um, there's a group of writers uh, on interviewers that are inmates and the team from DU Pi who have interviewed about 80 or 90 individuals, including me, who are creating an interview-based play. I don't know if they've given it a name yet, um, but I've seen some of the work they're doing and who they're interviewing, like, like officers and inmates and victims and district attorneys. And, um, it's gonna be very, very interesting. And so it should be done by sometime this year. So um, we're exploring about how we preview it. And I mean, they have volumes of pages of interviews. And so they're trying to narrow it down and tell this story around uh, incarceration and, and the human experience of people who are in the walls, you know, behind the walls, who are working it, the leaders, like someone like me, district attorneys um, and others around the prison experience. And so um, you, you may not get Hamilton, but I think you're gonna get, there's some work that's being done here that uh, I've seen some of the interviews and uh, oh my gosh, it's compelling because it's real and it's raw and um, it's uh, gonna ask some really great questions and hopefully provide a few answers around, around a theater-based experience. And so uh, stay tuned. Absolutely. But if we do get Hamilton there, I want you to play the king because I- <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I don't know if you know that or not, but I actually have some, uh, there's a, I have a theater background a bit and I uh, was in multiple plays back in, uh, in a small playhouse back in Anchorage. and. Um, so be careful what you ask for, be because, careful. Yeah. because they know, because even the inmates know, they're like, hey, sir, director, do you want to play the role? I mean, we're, so we had like Jesus Christ Superstar queued up before uh, COVID hit. And I played the part of, of uh, pilot uh, in Jesus Christ Superstar back in Anchorage. And the guy, the inmate who was playing that role, I mean, COVID kind of messed this up. So they, that's still in the queue to do. Uh, but I told him, I said, hey, um, how would you feel like if I stepped in for like a couple of shows? I mean, he's like, no, director, I'd be fine. I'm like, like that's a guy, you know, um, who's awful generous because once you audition and you get a role, you don't want to give it up. But um, yeah, no, stay tuned. I will, I will. And you stay tuned. Who knows about okay. Hamilton? <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you for Absolutely. your time and your wisdom. Yeah. And, uh, Take care. And your passion. Thanks, thanks for all you're doing. Okay. I'll be in touch. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye. Thank you, Dean Williams, for such a great conversation. Thank you for bringing the shift to the United States, the shift that you talk about in our podcast, the paradigm shift that really all most of America knows needs to happen. And thank you for leading the way and bringing principles from the Norway prison system to Colorado prison system, including normalization, um, dynamic security, activation, and the import model. Thank you for um, talking about the arts programs and for, for what you're doing to bring humanity to the men and women living in prison. And yes, there are dangerous people that need to be restrained, but they don't have to be tortured and put in solitary confinement for an indeterminate amount of time. Thank you for showing us what's possible. And I look forward to watching your performance of Hamilton because I have a feeling that's gonna happen. And thank you again, everyone, please subscribe, share, 
and um, like this podcast. And I look forward to more compassion in action as we continue our journey. Thank you.